Hi, welcome to our virtual tour of our newest exhibit, Ratified, Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote. I'm Grace Allen and I'm a museum educator here at the Tennessee State Museum. And I am Jennifer Watts. I'm also an educator with the museum. We'd like to take you around, show you a few of our favorite artifacts, and tell the stories of how Tennesseans played an important role in the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Let's get started. Here, in the first part of our exhibit, we discuss the important origins of the movement. The women's suffrage movement began in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, as an outgrowth of the abolitionist movement to end slavery. These activists met and they signed the Declaration of Sentiments and passed several resolutions calling for equal treatment and rights that were denied women at the time. Elizabeth Cady Stanton introduced the resolution demanding suffrage for women, but even many women at the convention were shocked by this idea. It was considered really radical. It was only after a persuasive speech by Frederick Douglass that the measure finally passed. The movement grew, but it was slow to reach the South because of its associations with anti-slavery activists from the North. But Tennessee women considered themselves political activists long before they called themselves suffragists. Though they were barred from the right to vote and many other rights, they found ways to support and express their political views. Women like First Lady Sarah Polk involved themselves in politics despite their circumstances. Hannah Richards is also an example of a woman who continuously fought for her freedom. She was born into slavery and freed in 1826, but a few years later she was enslaved for assisting and, and harboring an enslaved man who was likely her husband. She fought this and advocated for herself in courts and maintained her freedom. Only a few years later though she was stolen from her home, but she freed herself once again and returned to her community in Athens, Tennessee. She passed down her legacy to her grandson, William, who became a graduate and professor of law at Howard University and an advocate of women's and civil rights. This is one of my favorite artifacts in our exhibit. This wedding dress belonged to Ida Bonner, who got married in 1876. It's a great artifact because uh, it shows the dual aspect of what marriage meant to a woman at a time. It's a time of celebration. but. It also meant her legal identity was dissolved and absorbed into her husband's. This is a concept called coveture, and what it basically means is because she no longer had a legal identity of her own, she had um, no right to her own property, wages, the right to sue, or even the right to her own children. Essentially, her access to these things was dependent on her husband. After the Civil War, women gained a lot more access to education, and they began to work as teachers, clerks, and as businesswomen. But as I mentioned, many didn't have access to their wages. So, as you can tell, suffrage was about more than just the right to vote. It was about improving their lives and their community's well-being. They did gain some rights by, 1900, by the early 1900s including the right to practice law even, the right to their property and wages. These were small victories for the women's suffrage movement. Some of the other issues that they did support were issues like temperance uh, that went alongside with suffrage. Jennifer's gonna tell you a little bit more about this and about the early suffrage organizations in Tennessee. As Grace mentioned, women also were part of temperance organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union or WCTU. Membership in these organizations helped to lay the foundations for the push for voting rights for women. In 1889, the first woman suffrage organization was formed in Memphis, Tennessee, and its first president was Lyde Merriweather, also the state WCTU president. In the years that followed, suffrage will start to spread from the big cities to the rural communities, and by 1900, there were at least 10 suffrage organizations within the state. In 1906, the first statewide organization was formed called the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association, or TESA. 
It was formed in connection with the National American Woman Suffrage Association, a group that campaigned eventually for the 19th Amendment, a voting rights amendment that would affect the uh, women across the nation. Now, within these groups, as popularity and membership spread, not all women are going to be treated equally. Let's now learn how African American women participated in the movement. Like throughout the South, segregation and racism are going to be a part of the women's suffrage movement. Black women were not allowed to fully participate within the larger organizations led by white women. They worked toward the same cause, but were not allowed to attend meetings, especially not be leaders. So these women, from about the 1880s to the 1890s, began to organize their own clubs, focusing largely on improving their communities and civil rights issues. Mary Church Terrell, who you can see here in the exhibit, was the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, founded in the mid-1890s and whose motto was lifting as we climb. In Tennessee, we have a woman by the name of Juno Frankie Pierce. She was president of the Nashville Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Although women weren't typically allowed to speak publicly um, at certain events, Catherine Kenney invited Pierce to speak before the inaugural convention of the Tennessee a Woman's Suffrage Association and Tennessee League of Women Voters held at the state capitol in May of 1920. There, she is specifically going to address equality when she states, we are asking only one thing, a square deal. We want recognition in all forms of this government. So whether black or white, Tennessee women worked tirelessly to gain their political independence. The thousands of stories of Tennessee suffrages could not be included in our 8,000 square foot exhibit. So the museum has researched and designed and created this newspaper with stories from all 95 Tennessee counties. Now you can grab one within the gallery or you can check it out online at tnmuseum.org. Simply look for ratified statewide. Now I would like to take you and show you one of my favorite artifacts we have on display here in the museum. This is a banner actually carried by Tennessee suffragists. Not only is it supposed to be beautiful and appealing to the eye, but you can also see they used a lot of symbolism within the design. First, we have the gold, the yellow color. This had been used by the national movement since they chose it in the late 1860s. But here at the top, we can see the Liberty Tree. This will harken back to the American Revolution and their mantra of no taxation without representation. We have the scales here in the center to symbolize equality and justice within the law, and of course the rays of light to symbolize enlightenment. But what I'd really like you to focus on, uh, focus on is here at the bottom, the INC, short for Incorporated. It has its own story to contribute. From 1914 to 1918, the Tennessee Equal Suffrage Association actually split into two groups, the second being called Tessa Incorporated. Now you'll notice the darker color of the INC in comparison to the gold and yellow you see in the letterings above it. It makes me really wonder that maybe this was added after the fact to an already existing banner, but I'm not sure. What I am sure of is that the split actually worked to reinvigorate Tennessee suffragists toward the push for the 19th Amendment. Women like Lizzie Crozier French of Knoxville, Abby Crawford Milton of Chattanooga, Juno Frankie Pierce and Ann Dallas Dudley of Nashville campaigned, protested, marched. They created relationships with local politicians all in an effort to gain their favor toward voting rights for women. Let's now go to Grace and learn how the outbreak of World War I impacted the strategies of Tennessee suffragists and those 
nationwide. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA for short, encouraged the suffragists to join the war effort. This was a strategic move to demonstrate why women should get the right to vote. Suffragists joined as nurses and in many other capacities on the home front and abroad, proving their capabilities as equal citizens and their entitlement to the vote. If you look over here, you can see some amazing artifacts associated with women in World War I. By the end of World War I, the suffragists had gained many to their side, including President Woodrow Wilson. They knew they had the momentum they needed to push for a federal amendment to the United States Constitution, which they did in 1919, when the 19th Amendment passed in Congress. However, before an amendment can become law, it has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. At the time, they needed 36 states to individually meet and pass the amendment. Suffragists began focusing on local state legislatures to ensure passage. I'm going to show you another artifact that's one of my favorites in the exhibit and tell you a little bit more about this journey to ratification. Suffragists traveled the state in trains, cars, and even mail trucks to talk to local state legislatures and give speeches. They dressed vehicles like these in floral arrangements and used them in magnificent parades. By the summer of 1920, the suffragists knew that the fate of the amendment was most likely going to be in Tennessee's hands. They had won over 35 states and they just needed one more. But of the states left that could vote on the amendment, it was unlikely it would pass. So Tennessee was the best chance for the suffragists. The only problem was the state legislature was not in session. They needed Governor A.H. Roberts to call for a special session of the legislature in order to vote on the amendment. After much persuasion, winning the primary, and even a telegram from President Woodrow Wilson, Roberts finally did decide to call for the session. But the suffragists didn't rest on their laurels. They continued traveling the state, even by foot, to talk to legislatures for the last time. When August came, they all gathered in Nashville, Tennessee for the final battle. Let's go to Jennifer, who's going to tell us a little bit more about this and about some amazing artifacts surrounding the 19th Amendment. As Grace mentioned, Tennessee suffragists hit the ground running and campaigned every second they could. When the possibility of the 19th Amendment finally came to Tennessee, they flocked to Nashville. But so too did the anti-suffragists, the people opposed to women getting the right to vote. Anti-suffragists believe women voting would destroy the home and family. Some big businesses like distilleries, railroad companies, and textile mills also feared the female vote would change how they operated, calling for new laws concerning temperance, safety regulations, and child labor. Anti-suffragists also feared that African-American women would also gain the right to vote as well. These two dresses from the era are here to represent both the anti- and pro-suffragists here in the state of Tennessee. Anti-suffragists would often wear the color red or a red rose to symbolize their opposition. In contrast, pro-suffragists would often wear yellow or a yellow rose to identify themselves from the other group. In the state of Tennessee, particularly here in Nashville, the press often called the summer of 1920 the War of the Roses. Now in between the two dresses, our exhibit team has placed this desk. It is just like the ones used by our legislators in the summer of 1920. Now, I like how they placed it between the two dresses, just like the legislators themselves were split between the two sides. But let's get down to the vote. The 61st General Assembly's special session was called by Governor Roberts to begin on August 9th. By August 13th, 
the Senate had voted and ratified the amendment easily at a vote of 26 to 4. But the House of Representatives is really where they had the most concern, especially when you counted the number of yellow roses on the legislators present that day when they arrived on August 18th particularly when it came down to Speaker of the House, Seth Walker. Seth Walker was an anti-suffragist, and the first thing he did that day was actually to call for a vote on tabling the amendment, basically meaning they're going to put the amendment to side and they're not even going to discuss it. He believed he had the votes, but he was wrong. Representative Banks Turner had actually changed his mind and voted against tabling the amendment on two separate occasions, tying it at 48 to 48. And if anybody remembers from your kid playing tic-tac-toe, a tie is not a win. So Seth Walker began to sweat, but he really believed that he possibly still had the vote because if the uh, vote was still tied on the amendment, then a tie is not a win. So basically the amendment would fail nonetheless. What he didn't realize is someone else that day changed their mind. That's gonna be Representative Harry T. Byrne, who you can see in the exhibit above me. Harry Byrne was on the fence. He had two different mentors in his life telling him to do two different things. His political mentor was a current state senator and was an adamant anti-suffragist. Not to mention, on August 18th, when he arrived at the state capitol, he was seen wearing the iconic red rose. So it didn't look too good. But what people didn't know is his other mentor in his life, his mother, had wrote him a letter, and in his pocket, he carried it with him. Fed Byrne, who you can also see in our exhibit, wrote her son this letter addressed to the state capitol, which had arrived the morning of the 18th. And in it, she told him, vote for suffrage, don't keep them in doubt, be a good boy, and put the rat in ratification. And thankfully for us, he fathered his, uh, followed his mother's advice. The 19th Amendment was ratified by the House of Representatives at a vote of 51 to 49. The 19th Amendment had just passed. We have our 36 states. Behind me, you can actually see some artifacts graciously on loan to the Tennessee State Museum by the Byrne family. But we also have some additional artifacts on loan from the National Archives. Let's check them out. These are going to be facsimile documents, again, on loan from the National Archives. The first is the certificate signed by Governor Roberts certifying that Tennessee has ratified the 19th Amendment. The next one is going to be the letter sent along with the certificate by Governor Roberts to U.S. Secretary of State Brainbridge Colby. Next to that will be the letter Colby sent back to Roberts confirming his receiving of it. But the next two are the most fun. These are actually telegrams sent by uh, Seth Walker, we remember him, to Colby in a last-ditch attempt to get Tennessee's ratification nullified, dated August 25th and August 31st. Now, thankfully for us, he wasn't successful. But the ratification of the 19th Amendment is not going to be the end of our story. Let's go to Grace to learn what happened after ratification. Women did show up at the polls just a few months later in 1920. They actively participated in politics, and some even ran successfully for office, including Mildred Griffin, who served in the Tennessee House of Representatives between 1923 and 1925. Here's a card from Daisy Slover uh, showing that she ran for office as well in 1922. 
But women, particularly African American women, still face many challenges to their vote. The poll tax, which had been instituted in 1889, was a fee that had to be paid in order to vote. It was put into place alongside other Jim Crow laws to limit African American voters. Though the poll tax didn't apply to women at first, it was extended to them in 1922. In addition, other measures and restrictions on registration limited voters. Native Americans and people of Asian heritage also faced their own unique barriers to voting. It took many decades and acts of legislation before all these individuals were able to vote in all parts of the United States. But Tennessee women continued organizing and trying to assist with registration. They used skills that they had learned during the suffrage movement and formed organizations like the Tennessee chapter of the League of Women Voters and the Negro Women's League of Voters in Nashville, Tennessee. African American women continued to persist for the right to vote into the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Viola McFerrin was a leader that helped assist many black women and men in registering to vote. And she also uh, brought to the national attention voter discrimination. Many of these individuals who registered to vote were sharecroppers who were evicted from their homes and lands out of retaliation and denied services. McFerrin herself was forced to go all the way to Memphis for the birth of her child after being denied service at local hospitals. Many of these individuals took solidarity and refuge at tent cities that were erected in Fayette and Haywood counties. Unfortunately, these encampments were often overcrowded, unsanitary, and under constant threat of violence and terrorization. The poll tax was repealed in 1953, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 made discriminatory laws surrounding voting rights illegal. The persistence for voting rights has continued long past the 19th Amendment, but it's important to recognize its impact on us and on the continued expansion of voting rights. The 19th Amendment changed women's political status. They had to be considered as equal voters with the power to elect their governing officials. No longer were women political outsiders without the right to vote. Let's go over to Jennifer for some final concluding thoughts on our exhibit today. Through our exploration today, we have learned that the right to vote is not something that is guaranteed or comes easily. For more than 72 years, Tennessee women and men worked tirelessly to gain their political independence. We have learned through artifacts, larger than life graphics, and the stories of these Tennessee suffragists just how hard they worked. From the early actions of Hannah Richards to the work of early 20th century suffragists, they campaigned, they protested, they marched, they proved their citizenship during World War I. They also continued fighting the barriers to voting well into the decades that followed. Here we can see the names of the 96 Tennessee women who have served on our state legislature since the ratification of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago. And as you can see, we have left some space to add a few more names. And hopefully in the next 100 years, we'll have plenty more. Who knows? One of them might be you. On behalf of myself, Grace, and the Tennessee State Museum, Thank you so much for joining us as we virtually explored our newest exhibit, Ratify Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote. Stay tuned to our website and Facebook page for future virtual engagement. And don't forget to get out and vote.